Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. We're on the front line of markets and finance. There's a global war going on, savers versus speculators, financial terrorists versus the rest of us. And the front line on this markets and finance extends past just banks. It also includes companies like Monsanto, symbol M-O-N, New York Stock Exchange. Stacey Herbert, tell me more. Yes, Max Kaiser. They are in the first headline, WikiLeaks. U.S. ambassador planned retaliation against France over ban on Monsanto corn. So apparently, former ambassador Craig Stapleton was concerned about France's decision to suspend cultivation of Monsanto's MON810 corn and warned that a new French environmental review standard could spread anti-biotech policy across the EU. He said, quote, country team Paris recommends that we calibrate a target retaliation list that causes some pain across the EU since this is a collective responsibility, but that also focuses in part on the worst culprits. Yeah, I want to uh, point this out to uh, folks that Monsanto and their genetically modified seeds is another form of a fiat currency. It's another form of debt currency that they foist onto a population. They then become indebted, in this case, agriculturally indebted, but the currency itself is a form of a currency. And I reach out to my brothers in India because you're letting Monsanto into your country for really no good reason. They're there, they're doing all kinds of mischief there, and it's a form of fiat currency and control and debt control Indians. You should be aware of this. Well, there's a few things here to look at because first of all, he threatened retaliation. They, the State Department was looking at retaliation. What was that retaliation and is the financial crisis across Europe, for example, part of that retaliation? The other thing is that WikiLeaks, is the one that released this information. If it weren't for WikiLeaks, we would not know that the US State Department sought to punish France and the French people, by the way. The French people are the ones that are forcing their government to adopt these policies against genetically modified seeds. So punishing these people, we would not have known if it weren't for WikiLeaks releasing this information. And in fact, we would not have known if it were not for a few alternative media outlets no mainstream media and you can look here at this little image here i tried to i looked up on washington post not one single result for wikileaks monsanto revelations none well yeah okay just to review here Wik wikileaks and retaliation so the u.s is is threatening retaliation so u.s on behalf of an american corporation is threatening retaliation against france and other countries not to let in a corrupt genetically modified debt currency from Monsanto into their country. And then WikiLeaks, which, you know, I don't understand this. And the people in the U.S. or in the alternative media space uh, are trying to disparage WikiLeaks. They should be celebrating WikiLeaks because WikiLeaks is now the only entity that has taken on the corruption of mainstream media and the corruption of a Monsanto who's in business to enslave and to undermine economic and even uh, health, but even uh, any kind of real health. Because of course, these seeds have been shown to be extraordinarily dangerous, these Monsanto killer seeds. Yes, well, in fact, some of the health risk, according to Democracy Now!, who they had on a guest, uh, Jeffrey Smith, who said, by the third generation, most GM soy fed hamsters lost the ability to have babies. Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge risk. And we don't know because there's never been studies on the genetically modified health risk to humans. There's never been human studies right. on this material that is just released into the U.S. population by who? In 1992, a guy named Michael Taylor, the former lawyer for Monsanto. <laughs> so it's health risk and economic risk. And let me just emphasize, putting the health risk aside for a second, because of course Monsanto will hire the same lawyers to argue that these are healthy, that the oil industry hires the same front groups, the same scumbags. They'll come in there and defend Monsanto and they'll defend Exxon. But economically, it makes no sense. If you're an Indian and you have uh, a killer Terminator seeds that don't reproduce on their own, you have to buy them from Monsanto every single year. You're committing economic suicide, Indians. We get emails every day from India saying, when are you gonna cover India? Here's the big Indian story, India. You're being slapped in the face with genetically modified seeds and you jackasses to accept them.
Well, here are some of the other health risks involved. Yeah. Rodents fed GM corn, as the French had rejected this GM corn. Well, in rodents, it caused um, immune system responses and signs of toxicity. And studies showed organ lesions, altered liver and pancreas cells, changed enzyme levels, etc. Now, the, the other part of this is the moral hazard, because Americans accepted it in 1992 when Michael Taylor was the head of the FDA. He approved it without any oversight, no studies, no nothing. He is a former Monsanto lawyer. Well, look at this little clip here from Democracy Now! with Jeffrey Smith when he's saying, well, is the Obama administration any better, he's asked. Unfortunately, we were hoping for a lot more success. Um, President Obama, while he was campaigning here in Iowa, promised that he would require labeling of genetically modified crops. And since most Americans say they would avoid GMOs if labeled, that would have eliminated it from the food supply. But you see, he and the FDA have been promoting biotechnology. And unfortunately, the Obama administration has not been better than the Bush administration, possibly worse. And Max, why is he worse than Bush? Well, apparently, that same former um, Monsanto lawyer, Michael Taylor, he's now the U.S. food safety czar. I'm so ashamed. As an American, I can tell you, I wake up hanging my head in shame <laughs> at that sleazebag Hillary Clinton. She goes around the world representing America. She goes to India, and she pushes this seed crack, this dangerous health risk, economic risk, Monsanto seed to these poor Indians for one thing. I mean, forget about Americans. I mean, they'll put anything you put in front of their face. I mean, they, they you know, they're gone already. That's, they, you know, 9-11 was the iceberg that has sunk America. It's never coming back. But, you know, some of these other countries are still valuable. Like India's got a worthwhile culture. You know, we should try to save it. Yeah, but it's a continuation. It doesn't matter if it's Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, whoever it is, if it were Al Gore, if it were, uh, I don't know, Sarah Palin, they w still would have been doing this because it is Monsanto who executes retaliation against Europe for rejecting their seeds. Yeah, it's right. not Hillary Clinton, it's Monsanto. Well, 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 Hillary Clinton, of course, says, you know, the reason I bring her up is I remember famously she was like, oh, we don't want Blackwater, the mercenaries on the American payroll who commit, you know, like, extraordinary rendition and assassinations overseas on behalf of our corporate clients. We don't want them anymore. And then when she's Secretary of State, of course, she's got them right there. And that's who they call, like, Monsanto, of course, it turns out that Blackwater and Z, and of course, they're being sold and turned over. They're on the payroll of these corporations. <laughs> yes, corporations on Monsanto. Can, can, yeah. They're on the payroll of Monsanto. They can call up uh, Z or Blackwater, whoever the mercenary du jour is, and say, hey, hey, killers over there, are you working for us extra legally outside of all the rule of law? Go assassinate these people who aren't being force fed. Monsanto seeds like ducks on a foie gras farm. Just kill them. Just kill them. We don't care. We have no rule of law. <laughs> I mean, America's become an assassination crazed, you know, big porky Monsanto fed crackhead country of slopping pigs, nightmares, <laughs> no, okay. wait, 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 there's plenty of adjectives. Fill in your own adjectives. It should be just fill in your own adjectives. I mean, I mean, the thought of losing India, though, to Monsanto crack seeds is disturbing. I mean, this is a 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 year old culture. We're going to lose it for some freaking Monsanto seeds? Well, so Americans, are, something like over 90% of Americans are eating on a daily basis genetically modified food stuff. They don't know what, that it is genetically modified, but they're still eating it. And the studies are showing, on, at least on these other mammals, that it's causing health problems. Well, this takes us to the next headline, the big 5-0. 50 million Americans are now uninsured. That's the number of Americans lacking medical coverage now exceeds the population of Spain. This is one fifth of non-elderly Americans are uninsured. Well, this is the equivalent of the final solution. In Nazi Germany, they creamed them and put them in crematoriums and burnt them. America, they're just gonna cut them off from the health supply and all kinds of uh, excommunicate them from the digital money supply, and they'll die in the street. This is America's version of the final solution. Thanks, Obama, you freaking Nazi. It's the American population itself, because I witnessed with my own eyes massive anger against even the notion that we should ever extend health care to those 20 percent of Americans, non-elderly Americans, that have no health insurance. There was huge anger, like murder those people. We saw images of people being kicked on the ground who were paraplegic and said, go, you know, here's a dollar, go, go, get out of my face. So you could say all you want, you could attack Obama all you want, but he is just a man in head of a nation who are themselves rejecting these 20% of the population. So that takes me to this next headline. 
the U.S. government can't account for billions spent in Afghanistan. So while those Americans were there kicking their paraplegic neighbor on the ground, their U.S. government is apparently, they've lost $55 billion spent allegedly on balance sheet, by the way, so you know, with 55 billion spent and lost in Afghanistan to rebuild the country. Any protest about that? Any military industrial contractors down in Virginia being kicked on the ground while they're, you know, like laughing it up in bowls of champagne? Yeah, well, what's amazing, it doesn't make any sense because of course, you don't give your neighbor health care, so there's no way to contain, let's say, a virus. So you don't have the virus. Your neighbor or someone in your community or someone within a 500 mile radius gets a virus. Because there's no money in health care, you get the virus. You're putting your own health at risk by not ensuring health for the rest of the community. It's like not having a fire department, which incidentally, America's cutting fire departments from municipalities all over <laughs> yeah, the world too. It. Meanwhile, the money is going to mercenaries in Afghanistan who are breeding terrorists and training terrorists to attack Americans on airplanes. So, you, so you're, you're using the money that you would have used to protect yourself on the health and you're giving it to terrorists to attack you in the air. You're freaking out of your minds. But hey, if it weren't for you idiots, we wouldn't be having fun doing this show. You know, it's not just Americans who are insane. Here's a headline from the holiday period of the end of last year. Britain begins five billion pound sales spending frenzy. Now, the interesting thing about this spending frenzy that we witnessed in the UK is the fact that the reason why people are racking up even more debt on their credit cards, and it's because the VAT is increasing, the value added tax is increasing from 17 and a half percent to 20%. So they're trying to save that 2.5% increase in cost. but By racking up another 20% of interest on a debit card. At, at least. Who knows? Card. Some credit cards, these are store credit cards as well, and they're charging up to 30 35%. Right, but it makes sense. I mean, Ben Bernanke <laughs> has the same idea, doesn't he? Quantitative easing yeah. is he's floating a few trillion dollars in bonds for to save 2.5% on interest. In the meantime, loading onto the economy trillions of dollars worth of extra liability. Of course, Mervyn King over there at the Bank of England is just as foolhardy as Ben Bernanke. And you know, their idea of economics is one where having people consume themselves to death is beneficial to the economy as a whole. Mervyn King, what, what's wrong with you? What, what, you and Ben Bernanke should get out of the hot tub and go back to school and learn a few things. So Stacey Herbert, thanks so much once again for being on The Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All righty, when I come back, I'll be talking to James Howard Kunstler about this stuff and much more, so don't go away. Stay there. All right, we're back with The Kaiser Report. Special guest right here in the studio, James Howard Kunstler. He's the author of The Long Emergency and most recently, The Witch of Hebron, or Hebron, depending on whether you want to pronounce that correctly. Welcome to the Kaiser Report, James Howard Kunstler. Thank you, Max. What brings you to Europe? Uh, I really just wanted to get out of the USA for Christmas. Didn't want to be caught in the, wall, in the Walmart crush. Well, that's a global phenomenon, isn't it? This uh, shopping stampede. You see this in countries all over the world. This is what has replaced, America, this, this has replaced spirituality and religion in America, is this fanatical shopping, which doesn't do anyone any good who's actually doing the shopping because it puts them into catastrophic debt and, and, and it stokes this global um, disequilibrium between the U.S. and China, et cetera. Talk a little bit about, um, about this whole this debt scenario, how it's building and how that's going to cascade. And you're looking ahead now to this year. What do, you, what do you see? Well, you know, we hear a lot of arguments about whether we're in a deflation or an inflation. And as far as I'm concerned, the destination is really the same for both. You know, either way, you're going broke. You're either going to be in a society where there's a lot of cheap stuff for sale and nobody has any money, or you're going to be in a society with a lot of money that's worthless. And, you know, either way, I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of difference. My own guess is that we're going to see a sequence of events that will first be the compressive deflationary de uh, depression, uh, w which will simply be a matter of private obligations and money, uh, debt money, not being repaid to such a monumental degree that, it, uh, that the printing of money, so-called, or creation of money by a government, could not possibly keep up with the disappearance 
of uh, money. Okay, so there's two sides of the same coin. Yeah. In either case, the purchasing power goes down. Yeah. Okay. For example, you know, a lot of people, I have been uh, among the people following the peak oil story. Yes. I think it's important. I think that the, you know, the energy inputs into our society will make a difference in the ability of that society to function. But, uh, you know, if you follow a deflationary scenario, what you end up with is oil that may be very cheap. Maybe it'll be $23 a barrel, but no one will have any money to buy the oil. Okay, so, now let, let's just fine tune this a little bit. Because during the 30s in America, you had deflation and the purchasing power of the dollar went up. But you also had a gold standard. Here, there's no more gold standard. There's only fiat currencies. If debt is collapsing and purchase power, power is collapsing, then um, effectively, you're not going to, why, why can't then all that money that's floating in from the central bank to try to bolster these economies, you can end up with a higher price of oil in a deflationary environment, so to speak, in a debt deflation. Well, that's there the are key. all kinds of things that can go on. But I think, you know, with oil, I mean, oil has a whole other set of factors that are going to push it one way or another. Peak oil being a huge one. Okay, of let, course, let yes. me segue into peak oil because this but, is one. Uh, I, let me answer your okay. question because I think this is important. You know, there, there's a, a concept in finance called price discovery, okay? And uh, that applies to markets and the purpose of markets is to establish what the reality-based value of something is. But there's another kind of price discovery that we're going through now. And it's sort of discovering the value of what your society really is in terms of what it can produce uh, in the way of wealth and value. And when you have currencies that are not pegged to anything real, that are just pegged to a general idea that you've got a good, productive, wealth-producing society, and it, when that's not true anymore, you know, when all of your activity is basically just uh, financial finagling and swindling, then uh, you, know, you have a discovery process that that society has lost value. And that's really going to be, I think, what will put the American currency out of business. OK, in the long emergency of your book, you, I guess you could say it's a story or it's a narrative about peak everything. And it's in this, uh, this, I, this genre, this idea that um, values are set to change considerably, and that the idea of growth, or what in America used to be called manifest destiny, just this push west toward unlimited growth, has to change because we've hit the end of, these, of the resources. But now you see countries who are exploring uh, this idea of, of uh, instead of gr uh, GDP, gross domestic product, they're looking at GDH, gross domestic happiness. And in the UK, for example, there's now a task force under David Cameron looking at how can we increase the happiness quotient of our society. And of course, Bhutan famously has gross domestic happiness as the, uh, as the underlying economic uh, metric that they go down. Is this, have you looked at this? Is it possible? Is this where we're going? It says in the Constitution, pursuit of happiness. Isn't this natural for Americans to pursue happiness? Is that what they mean by happiness? It's an interesting formulation, which is actually just another way of iterating uh, a therapeutic process. You know, uh, the USA has become a therapeutic society. So it's much more about feeling good about yourself than what you do. So that's really what that represents. And it's also, it introduces yet another layer of abstraction to a financial system which is already hopelessly overly abstract. So we're just, just another way of kidding ourselves. But feeling good about what you do in America and around the world means consumption. And if we're at peak everything, then you're not going to get that buzz from consuming anymore because it's all consumed out. So where are you going to find that happiness? Well, you know, the, the problem really is, is, as we said in the beginning, either path that you take uh, is going to take you in the direction of basically a lower standard of living. You know, either your money is worthless or uh, uh, there's lots of stuff to buy and you have no money. Now, you know, the problem that the USA faces is that we seriously have to make other arrangements for daily life. And it's something that we uh, cannot overcome. We cannot get to that, even the beginning of the idea, the beginning of thinking about that. Uh, you know, largely because of what I call the psychology of previous investment. Talk about the psychology of previous investment. What does this mean? Well, it's a state of mind in which you have put all of your wealth into a certain infrastructure for daily life. You know, whether it's suburbs or freeways or master charge arrangements or Wall Street or whatever we've put all of our money into. And 
having done that, you can't imagine letting go of it or even reforming it very much. Right, so the infrastructure uh, along with the resource availability is collapsing. And um, there's a need for new relationships uh, outside of this competitive relationship in America. It's free market competition and everyone is competing uh, to get ahead. But if there's nothing to get ahead against because everything has effectively been consumed, then where, where, what's this new? And, and the problem is, of course, if you talk about collectivism or if you talk about the, the common wealth, you know, you hit that third rail of communism in the America's minds. They have this in, entrenched, embedded thought that anything that has to do with the good of society as a whole is evil. How are we going to transition to having a workable, livable society again without killing each other? Because if yeah. you know, reading your 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 work, um, it, it's on one hand, it's very pragmatic in that it, it kind of details exactly what's going on, and in the, and but it also opens up the question: is what? How are we going to be able to live together? Well, I think that we are in for a, quite a bit of mischief, and it's very hard to really state how bad it could be. I mean, I think there could be a lot of geopolitical friction, conflict. Um, Last year he predicted a social unrest in America. It didn't yeah. happen, it happened in Europe. What happened, what went wrong? Well, um, you know, we'll get there, don't worry. You know, uh, people are gonna get ticked off sooner or later. All those people who are uh, sitting in uh, mobile homes with no propane, uh, with a, you know, one bowl of Fruit Loops for the whole family. But uh, a couple of things. First of all, the, the free market idea, especially the free market idea as it's being put across by the right wing in America, the new Jacobins, as I call them, is really just um, a, a way of saying that uh, you, you cannot prevent Wall Street from continuing to swindle you. You know, and that, that's what that's really about. But uh, to, get to the, get to the heart of the question you asked, I think what we're looking, in, what we're heading into uh, should be called a reset a reset of the terms of everyday life, uh, of the terms of commerce, of the terms of how we do finance and banking and the operations of these things, you know, so that they're not based on swindling, they're, they're not based on creaming off s stuff that uh, you're not really entitled to. You know, I don't think that we're going to enter a, a rapture of, you know, communal uh, cooperation and happiness and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a utopian. And I was reading about the French Revolution this morning. I was kind of inspired to read about it, having seen the outline of the Bastille on the Boulevard Henry IV. And, you know, there, there are tipping points for things. And my sense is that on that day on July 14th, 1789, they had, you know, a mob went over to the Bastille and they ended up doing something that was kind of horrible. They took the warden of the Bastille, who is no, known as the governor of the Bastille, they cut off his head and they paraded it around on a pike. And that was going into a frontier of social unrest that they had not been in before. And that was really a line that had been crossed. We have no idea what it's going to be for us. You know, maybe some 99er will go into a treasury office and scalp uh, some sub-deputy official. Mm. You know, maybe... Uh, you know, somebody will uh, set off a rocket in Lafayette Square, you know, who knows. But uh, there are certain points in history where all of a sudden stuff just changes and you're in a different place. Right. So you don't see any kind of a transition, lateral transition. It almost... Uh... We're resisting any kind of a coherent transition. And, right. you know, we are not able to construct a coherent consensus about what's happening to us. And we're not able to also figure out what we're going to do about it. Right. So with no coherent analysis of what's really going on, we can't expect a coherent transition. It's unlikely. So and we so end up with a, with a pre-revolutionary, you know, revolutionary, revolutionary mode. And, you know, folks who are thinking about ultimately who is the new warden of the Bastille? Who would be the guy to, whose head would find itself on a pike? in the year 2011. Who would be that guy? Any, any guesses? Oh my gosh. There could be so many things. You know, I, these things seem to be epidemics that go in cycles. For example, I don't know if you remember, you may be a little younger than I am, but you know, when I was a, uh, a college student, we lived through an epidemic of very traumatic assassinations. I don't know if you remember how, just how overwhelmingly traumatic, for example, the assassination of Robert Kennedy was, because that was like the last vestige of hope for a generation. And I think it affected a lot of my cohorts really, really 
badly. You know, we haven't had a lot of mischief like that, of that kind. And, uh, you know, mob mischief is also infectious, and we haven't had any of that. Um, you know, I suspect we'll start to see some things around the employment issue. I mean, that's an easy call. Uh, as, uh, you know, Mr. Taleb would tell you, of course, you can't predict the black swan events because they are, by definition, the black swan events, the things that you can't see. Yeah, uh, the, the latest know. book is, well, go ahead. The Witch of Hebron. Yeah. The Witch of Hebron, which we, a lot, we mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and I understand sales spiked enormously be based, great. based on, that, on that program. So uh, it's an excellent book. But that's all the time for we have today. Uh, James Howard Kunstler, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Pleasure. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report. I want to thank Stacey Herbert and, of course, my guest, James Howard Kunstler. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.